For more than five years, I was in a drive-thru. And often when I was on the window, when the sun was in the perfect spot in the sky, it would reflect off of the stainless steel of the surface where like you could put food and then hand it out to reflect directly into my f***ing eyeball. And it sucked. And like, I kept telling them like, yo, people are getting blinded by this shit, bro. Like it is the sun, which is a deadly laser. Maybe we do something about this. Obviously nothing ever happened. And uh, so I thought for a while that, well, it was always the left side of my face that was on that side getting blasted by the sun, my left eye, and that's the eye that's worse. So I thought, oh, well, if only my left eye's sight is getting worse, maybe it's because of the fact that this sun is constantly hitting me in the eye, despite my best effort. I felt like that was a fine hypothesis to make, and it's possible that it could have had a part to play in some capacity with the waning of my vision. But no, it turns out that the primary thing is that I have an exceedingly rare eye disease that if left untreated, could make me go blind. So that's cool. So it is not actually the case that I've become Canadian. Uh, it is in fact the case though that they took my goddamn eye away. If you're wondering why I'm using this very shoddily made PNG tube avatar, it's because I recently had eye surgery where they stole my eyes first lining uh, and strengthened my cornea or my corneal lining to counteract a rare eye disease that I happen to have called keratoconus. It's uh, quite cringe. And, you know, I'm just going to be talking about it in this segment. The reason why I'm using the avatar is not because, like, I have an eye patch or I am missing an eye or because necessarily I look like shit right now, though I kind of do compared to what I would normally look like on a stream, but mostly because I don't want to have stream lights in my face while, you know, my eye is still in recovery mode from taking in all those high-level important ideas, a.k.a. UV lights, uh, light beams and lasers, which looked very cool and I will describe and draw. But yeah, so... I had a procedure done called cross-linking, and it's a surgery that is done to halt the progression of what's called progressive keratoconus. Uh, I've actually had another surgery before, which was very helpful. This is the video for it. What happened to my nose? Do not tell Hassan Piker he's bad at Valorant. I had a septoplasty done so that I could breathe like a normal human being for the first time in like 25 years which is kind of cool. That's helpful because I have year-round allergies. I'm allergic to pollen, dust, mold, animal dander, uh, and some other foods and stuff, but that's not as relevant, like environmental allergies we're talking about here. I also have just like fucked sinuses generally, probably because of that. So having a deviated septum made it so that breathing, which is already going to be hard for me, is a lot harder. So I ended up getting a septoplasty, which is, you know, this is literally when I got home from that surgery. Uh, I took this picture, made the meme, and then after that suffered for a while <laughs> in recovery. So this is going to be like another video like that. Except in this video, I'm actually on camera. But it was also substantially longer after the procedure. Uh, because I couldn't talk as much. Because it's like it's an invasive surgery that affects the sinuses heavily. Uh, which the eye one is not. So luckily I can talk like a normal. So I have a little thing here to uh, be able to illustrate this to you. Which I think is fun and interactive. So it's keratoconus. Also, happy, late, happy uh, St. Patrick's Day for the colors we got. So, keratoconia, keratoconus. So, it's essentially a very rare uh, eye disease where the corneal lining, so the lining of your eye for your cornea, is gradually weakened over time. So, you'll have a little eyeball. I guess I should draw it larger. You'll have an eyeball, right? And here's, like, the iris, which is where the color, here's the, the pupil. This is going to be a bit stylized. Here's the iris, where the color is, and then the whites of your eyes and whatnot. And the cornea is somewhere around here. And the way eyeballs work is that they have uh, internal eye pressure. So there's pressure within the eye that's pushing out at all times. And because of that, if your corneal lining slowly diminishes, the surface of your eye will have little pushes upward, and it'll distort how light is taken in by the eye which then distorts how you perceive things, as well as um, how light interacts with it. Like, you become more light sensitive. You can see, like, flashes of light or, like, floating lights because of the fact that, like, light coming in is going to bounce off it differently than if it was, like, a normal uniform shape like an eyeball is supposed to be. The procedure I got is called cross-linking. Does it hurt the eye bumps? No, I can't feel any of it. I can see the difference that it made in my eye, and I can talk about the history of that. But the, the procedure that I had done, the surgery is called Oh, I did write cost link inking. That's true. That's what, that's what you do in uh, Splatoon, actually. That's different. Cross-linking. 
which is essentially they take off the first layer of your eye, the epithalum or some nonsense like that. I forget what it's called. It's something like that. Um, they take it off and then they drop these medicinal, I forget what exactly they are. I could look it up, but what would be the fun in that? I probably should. Cross-linking. Eratoconus. Corneal cross-linking from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Treats a weakened or warped cornea. Pog. So, they numb the eye, which they did. I laid down, they numb my left eye, because that's the one that was operated on. I have it in both eyes, so I will need the right eye done at some point. It's just that the left eye is worse, so you want to get that, you know, halted. The progression of it getting worse halted as quickly as possible, so that I don't go virtually blind, which, you, which can happen. Uh, if the keratoconus gets bad enough, the only way to, like, get your vision back in working order is to get a corneal transplant, which is uh, not what I would want. That's much more invasive than the procedure I had. And I should say, though, also that it doesn't fix your eyesight. My eyesight is as bad as it's become because of the keratoconus, and for me not getting this done earlier because I wasn't as aware of it. It is unlikely that this procedure will, once I'm fully healed, increase my vision and the quality of it. It'll just stop it from getting worse. So if you don't do that, like, the only thing after that is corneal transplant, and luckily I'm not having to do that. So then... Your ophthalmologist removes the thin outer layer of the cornea, the epithelium. So close. Helium. There's helium in the eye. This allows the medication to reach deeper into the cornea. You should not feel any pain due to the numbing drops. And that's true. It was very interesting. So, like, obviously, if you're squeamish about stuff like this, I guess I should have made that a thing. Like, I should have put a disclaimer up. Caution. There's going to be uh, descriptions of very minor surgery in this video. Uh, so if that's something that might make you feel bad, then be careful. So I'm just going to draw what I saw, okay? Um, so here I am laying on a table. Here, this is me. Are you ready? And I had my, um, I just had my hands folded on my chest, essentially. This was me, okay, on the table. And they have this machine above you. Is this loss? Maybe. They have this machine above you that just, you know, blasts light down so they can see what they're doing. Um, they keep your eyeball open with a little, I assume, I didn't see what it looked like, but it was a clear, I assume a ring that just keeps your eye open so that you don't have to do it because that would be hell. Uh, and it allows them to, you know, use the inside of the ring to be able to drop the eye drops and use the tool that they use to remove the epithelium. Um, so that was really fucking interesting, like seeing that. So like in the actual person view, I'm looking up. And I'm seeing the little tool they use come in. And you don't feel any of it. But you, you, do, like, you feel your eyeball being pressed down just like a little bit. I guess I should draw the eye first. It was very small. You feel your eyeball being pushed down like a little bit. Like when you rub your eyes, for instance. But you don't feel any... Like you feel that in terms of like you're aware that it's happening, I should say. How do you keep your eyes still? The little ring that keeps it open. And then you just look straight ahead um, at the thing that they have for you to look at. But like, you don't feel anything. And they essentially just rub it along the surface. And at a certain point, like I saw like little squiggles on my eye, which was like the epithelium, I imagine, that was like being removed and pushed around. And then eventually that all went away to the point where it just, it, like, it just looked kind of as normal. The numbing drops obviously are huge for this, <laughs> um, because otherwise I imagine that would really suck. So luckily they have that. Well, I, I should say, so for the first 30 minutes after the epithelium is removed, the first 30 minutes is them putting in this yellow eye drop into your eye. So they put the eye drop in. They tell you to blink a bunch of times. And then you close your eyes and you, you close your eye and you keep it closed. And that's to put the medicinal drops in for the first time. So let me see if I can get... Oh, okay, so it's vitamin B, riboflavin, eye drop medicine is applied to the cornea for about 30 minutes. And that's put on the cornea to strengthen the corneal lining itself. And you do that for 30 minutes. And essentially, the way I think about it, I don't know that this is actually accurate, uh, but like we have the eye, the epithelium is removed, and then like we're getting to the cornea, which we'll put here as, like a, as this dotted line. The way I think about it is that the, the vitamin B drops kind of form like a superficial layer of like jelly, we could say, um, which is meant to like seep into your cornea, which I guess it should be on top of it which is like seeps into your cornea and strengthens it, you know? And, you know, hopefully it should be uniform. And that's for 30 minutes. So that just sets in your eye and you get a bunch of the drops. Uh, I forget how often it was, like every three minutes or something. I don't remember. And then after that, you move over to the UV light machine. And this shit was cool as hell. Uh, 
Oh, also, I should say I was allowed to have one earbud in and listen to music. I happened to listen to Esotericism's Slayer album, as well as um, Pyroglyphics. Oh, damn, I can't actually read all this. It's something or other. I don't know this kanji. Wadino. Wadino nai something or other. E something or other. These two albums. Was it on your phone? Yeah, I'm not going to bring a fucking cassette player into the goddamn operating room. <laughs> Are you insane? In terms of surgery prep, there wasn't any. Really. Like, for me. Like, other surgeries were, like, you go under anesthesia. Uh, like, you have to, like, not eat and blah, 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 blah. But I didn't have to go under an anesthesia. They just used a numbing drop. So, yeah, I got to listen to music the whole time, which was chill. I, I specifically picked something that was more background music because I wouldn't want anything that would be, like, super memorable. Not to, like, no disrespect. But, like, no, I wouldn't want something to be super memorable just in case I had a bad experience. Uh, I didn't want it to, like, taint the memory that I have of the music. Luckily, I had a fine experience. But, yeah, that's 30 minutes. And then, so the next 30 minutes, they bring you over to, you know, the UV light machine. So then we take, I guess we'll just take this again, huh? Except there's a new machine now. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm here, lost up. And there's a different machine that's just absolutely pumping me through a very targeted UV light. And I have to say, it looked cool as fuck. So if there's any constellation to this experience, is that the UV, like staring directly into this UV light laser for 30 minutes, where they hold your eye open for you with a little ring thing, it was pretty chill. They also, they keep dropping the, uh, the vitamin B eye drops in this entire 30 minutes as well. So yeah, I had to keep my eye open for 30 minutes, but luckily I didn't have to do it. It was done for me <laughs> by, like I say, this ring thing. They put in your, uh, they like, you know how, like, you've seen a monocle or like if you've ever like had like a disc that you've tried to hold in front of your eye when you were a kid or something. It's like that. So anyway, this sounds like a pretty intense experience. It is not as it would turn out. I mean, it's intense in terms of like, I've never had this happen to me before. <laughs> and um, it's an hour of that, you know, of being in a, on an operating table, just, you know, laying there with your eye forced open for half of the hour <clears throat> after having your epithelium removed. But um, the numbing drops do their damn job, that's for sure. So the light itself looked cool as hell. So for the purposes of the light, my understanding is that the UV light activates the almonds within the vitamin B drops, the riboflavin drops, and just helps them work better in some capacity. I guess we could just read it. Next, a special device shines a focused beam of UV light rays at your cornea for close to 30 minutes. The light activates the riboflavin in the cornea. This helps form new bonds between the collagen fibers in your cornea. Nice. They don't take the eye apart. They've removed the literal first layer of it. <laughs> that was it. It's not like they bisected it and implanted a microchip on the inside to be able to see through my eye long term. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so the light itself looked cool as hell. So when I was first looking at it, so there's a bunch of different lights, so I guess I'll make a palette so I can easily color pick. So there's a red one, which is what the crosshair is used, or is the color the crosshair uses. Then there's like a deeper blue one, which was like a ring around the outside of the circle that was the UV light setup. And then there was like a lighter blue variant as well, and it looked very cool. So I guess we'll start with this. So it's a circle here, and this is actually like really faint, so I guess I should make the density a lot less. Around the outside, like even this is like the line thickness is too thick, but it's fine. Then there's the crosshair in the middle, which is what I need to focus on this entire time. Like as, as the person underneath the UV light, you are meant to focus on it as best as you can, which is going to be difficult, especially depending on how deteriorated your vision is from having keratoconus. Um, luckily, I was able to do it pretty well. I, they, the doctor was even like, oh, wow. There was like another doctor that was there and they were also seeing you know, the process happen. And he was like, oh, they're focusing on it really well. And I thought, I thought, you know, I started pogging at that point. I was like, hell yeah, you're goddamn right. I'm here to make your job easier and my experience better. So this is not what you think it is. <laughs> so the first time they did the damn thing, the blue lights kind of looked like a lattice, almost like a basket weave. So it was like this. And I eventually come to find out that the reason why it looked like this was because I wasn't as focused on it as I needed to be, and that's because it was the first time I was looking at it, right? So it was all over the goddamn place. And also the vitamin B drops on my eye, like, needed to settle. And because of the fact that there's a liquid on the surface of my eye, 
any light that I'm taking in is bouncing around on the surface of the liquid. Uh, so any, like, imperfections in the liquid is going to make the lights go fucking brazy, right? <clears throat> and then eventually, when I'm able to get the light perfect, like, when I'm, I'm able to focus on it as good as I can, it turns out they might just be, like, little circles, but the best I could get was little diamonds, almost, like, rounded corner diamonds all over the goddamn place. So it was like this a bunch of times. I wish I could just stamp it. Is there a stamp tool in this? There's not. But yeah, it's just, it's just like this a whole bunch of times. Where the diamonds aligned in one direction, or pointing towards the middle, one direction. And like I say, it's likely that they were circles, not diamonds. It, it's likely that the way my eye was interpreting the light, as focused as I could be on it, that they became these diamond shapes. That could be incorrect, though. Like, I, I could be wrong on that. Because I, I remember the doctor and the, the, the assistant that was helping him were remarking about, like, oh, I, I always wonder what it looks like when people are looking into the, the laser, because I assume they've not had it done, because the only reason you need to is if you have, like, progressive keratoconus or whatever else. Uh, and I was trying to, like, describe it to them, because I find that very interesting, of, like, trying to help people understand what I'm seeing. It's, like, a fun little exercise. It's also helpful, I'm sure, for their job as well. And, like, what other people might say to them could differ, and that could be cool, because different people will see it differently depending on their eyesight and all this kind of shit. But anyway, there we go. No, it's, it's, it's not that rare overall. Like, they, they have a fair amount of patients that come in for cross-linking, but I think you can get cross-linking for uh, things that aren't keratoconus, like um, glaucoma, maybe, or something like that. Because um, I think keratoconus and glaucoma are kind of similar in some ways. Glaucoma usually happens as you're old, like, much older, though. I think, but, um, so that's what it looked like when I focused on it really, uh, intensely, and that was really cool, and, like, I knew I was doing it well when it started to look like this, because I imagine the more focused you are, the better the UV light can hit your eye, and then the better it'll be when it's, when you're working on you, so what was interesting is that when I moved my eyes, like, when I looked around, the blue light would, like, it, it kind of looked like the show Chowder, where there's a pattern on the inside of what's moving inside the line work, and the pattern doesn't change, it just moves around inside the line work. And that's kind of what it looked like when I would, like, look slightly to one side or the other. I wouldn't try to, obviously, but, like, if I ever would look around, and then the doctor would have to reposition it, that's kind of what it looked like. And then also what was interesting is that when I did look around a little bit like that, like, move my eye, even in those slight movements, instead of, like, being this diamond shape, they would get, like, extended out like little beams, like to varying lengths, which was really neat. And they would move like in different directions because like the, it's a physical beam of light when it's like this, like if it moves to one side, like if it moves far enough, it'll look like that beam of light. And it's a conical shape because it's coming from the little light source diode, whatever it is that it's coming from. And that was really cool, too. So I found that to be very neat. And that's 30 minutes. So for 30 minutes, you know, I'm talking to the doctor, to the assistant. I'm relaying information they need from me, like how I'm doing, yada yada, how's it feeling. I'm asking questions. I'm talking about the procedure because I'm just a generally curious person. And I find that when it comes to medical things, asking them questions is a good way to conceptualize what's, you know, happening to you and why it is. And if you have any reservations about it happening, like anxiety or whatever, that can help you feel better about it, more grounded, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have that, luckily. I just have, like, general anxiety, like, before a procedure. It's like, oh, yeah, that's going to happen, and I've never experienced it before. So there's going to be, like, the anxiety everybody feels, but I don't have anything that's, like, disruptive that other people might. Uh, but I imagine that could be helpful as well for people that do. Uh, but luckily, I have always been pretty good with this shit. And it also helped pass the time a lot better. Because, like I say, it's, a, it's an hour, which isn't that long in the grand scheme of things, but you're awake for all of it. Um, so, like, there could be even longer procedures, but, like, they put you under, and then you wake up later in, like, a split second, it feels like to you, but, like, you've been actually out for, like, three hours or something, you know? It's like when you sleep. But for this, I was awake the whole time. So, it did help it, you know, pass a lot better, a lot quicker, I imagine. <clears throat> and, yeah, so that was that. And then, so then once that's over, the doctor puts the bandage contact lens in my eyeball, which is exactly what it is, you know? It's just, it's just a contact lens. That is a bit more structurally firm, I imagine, than the standard contact lens for corrective vision reasons. But yeah, so they put that on the eye, and then they send you away. 
obviously, like they tell you, you should probably bring sunglasses. So I did uh, for the drive home. You're not allowed to drive there yourself, obviously, because your eyes all fucked up. And uh, the side effects of the fact that the numbing drops are going to wear off at some point, you'll start to feel. So that was cool. <laughs> uh, we ended up going to the pharmacy, getting uh, my eye drops that I needed. So this was fucked up, okay? I've experienced post-operative, you know, discomfort and whatnot. And this was not as bad as others I've experienced. <clears throat> so like I said, I've had a septoplasty before. That is a procedure to essentially correct a deviated septum. So my septum was deviated because of genetics or how my body developed as I grew up. Yada, yada, yada. Essentially, it means that the thing in the middle of your nose that people put a ring on and it can look nice is all wonky on the inside. I quote my doctor, he literally said it was all screwed up, or it was his wording, which I believe, frankly. Uh, and because I have allergies, sinus issues, having that inhibit my clarity of breath, and my breathing pathways was not great. So I had that done, and that's very invasive. They had to put me under, I had to um, you know, do all the before surgery prep, yada, yada, yada. And the aftercare for that was a lot more intense than this. I had to have a bandage on my nose. I had to like put the saline spray or whatever it is in my nose on a regular interval to keep it moisturized uh, and so it doesn't dry out so it can heal better. There was a, uh, I forget what they're called, but there's these essentially, it's kind of like a structure that they put in each of your nasal passageways and they go in very deep, like inches into your nose. Uh, and it doesn't feel like they're that deep in, but when they take it out, it's like, whoa, that shit was in my nose for a week. Uh, and that's there to make sure your nasal passages and the septum heals in the correct, you know, position, like a cast almost, I guess. And that they're sewn into your nasal as well. It's a lot of shit. But for that, like sleeping wasn't that bad. The big problem I had was it was like ruinous to my throat. Like um, my throat was it got kind of fucked up, I think, because of the anesthesia tube. Uh, I had like a really bad throat soreness and it made it hard to eat or drink anything other than water. Um, so like I was having difficulty keeping calories, so I had to get like Ensure and Gatorade in order to get like liquid calories and electrolytes and shit to not die. So that was great. But overall, like it was it was chill, you know. The worst recovery from something I've ever had in my life was not actually from a surgery like that. It was from I'm still unaware exactly what it was. I just call it combination food poisoning, food allergy reaction. And then the anxiety associated with that. So essentially what had happened was I had eaten a protein bar and it didn't taste great. It was really late at night one night. I'd eaten a protein bar. I've eaten them all the time. It was peanut butter. There's no tree nuts in it. <clears throat> That's what I'm allergic to. I'm not allergic to peanuts. So I ate this protein bar. It didn't taste great, but it like didn't taste foul. So I was like, fuck it. You know, I'll just finish it. Whatever. A little bit later, I end up feeling a similar response to how it feels when I have an allergic reaction to something I've eaten. So, like, I feel a tightness in my chest. It becomes a little bit harder to breathe. It's never deathly for me, luckily. Like, I'm not that allergic. I am prescribed an EpiPen, but, like, it wasn't that bad. So that started happening, and that was annoying. And it got my anxiety moving a little bit. Like, is this something I'm going to need to go to the doctor for? Like, you know how your mind raises in situations like that where you don't exactly know what's happening? Uh, it's not great. Yeah, simul <laughs> yeah, simultaneous Campylobacter and Salmonella. Yeah, like the Northern Lion special. <clears throat> I, it could have been something similar, though I didn't have the similar symptoms in terms of bowel issues that he described. Yeah, fuck it, we ball. Famous last words. So I ended up going up to uh, one of my roommates being like, yo, I think I might be having an anxiety attack. What does that feel like for you? Because I knew they had experienced it before. I ended up taking like these anti-anxiety meds that are like for breakthrough anti-anxiety shit because I was getting fucked up on that. And um, I didn't know exactly what it was. And there were so many symptoms happening at the same time. So I had that protein bar. The bar itself is like, yo, <clears throat> this is processed in a plant that does also process products that contain tree nuts. So we cannot guarantee 100% that it's not going to kill you, but it shouldn't. Lol. Good luck. And I had no problems with it for a year or two. Uh, so I guess I just got unlucky. And I think the, the protein bar was bad as well. So there was that. And then my fucking demon cat is very territorial and got spooked by something outside when I was walking back in the house and bit the hell out of my one leg, like really badly. Uh, and now obviously, like it wasn't malicious. I still love him. 
Uh, but I didn't know that if, like, oh, if the saliva that I'm allergic to in the cat gets into the bloodstream, is that a thing that could blah, blah, blah? That seems incredibly unlikely. Obviously, I will have an allergic reaction in terms of on my skin to that, but it's unlikely that it, like, gets into the blood and becomes a broader problem, but I don't fucking know, you know? So I was worried about that as well, and um, I was also having, like, lower abdominal pains, which I didn't know exactly where they came from. I thought maybe I was sleeping weird and I was like crushing my testicles or something. I didn't know what the fuck it was. Um, so like it was just like an absolute confluence of factors that like bounced off each other like fucking ping pong to the point where like the body aches and pains and the difficulty breathing and the chest tightness and the, the stomach pain was all making my anxiety worse because I didn't exactly know what was happening. And then the anxiety was making hypochondriac type symptoms present in my mind like is everything wrong in my body am i literally dying and that just reinforced the negative aspects of the physical problems that i was having and it was just like a absolute like mental shutdown that destroyed my mind and i was able to successfully fall back asleep a little bit after taking like the breakthrough anxiety med uh, i woke up in a cold sweat though not very long after i was having difficulty breathing more or less I ended up going to a uh, urgent care clinic and they looked at me and like everything was fine. I thought I might have had bronchitis or something as well because I had recently had what I assumed to be the flu. It could have been COVID. I didn't go anywhere. Like I quarantined just in case. Should have gotten it tested. The at-home test said I was clear, but you never know. Uh, but I got quarantined, so I did what I needed to do for society. But I should have obviously looked into it further to see, you know, for help for the doctors. But anyway, so like I thought like, oh, maybe I because I had gotten over that, I had a cough as well. I forgot to mention this. This was also a part of it. Because of that, I had a lingering cough that I still kind of have to this day, but not as badly. And I should say this was many months ago, almost a year ago, maybe at this point. But yeah, I had a cough as well, which was also reinforcing the not being able to breathe problem. And also probably fucking with like my abdomen and my stomach when it comes to uh, like me being able to breathe. There was so many things that were happening at the same time that it was like I say, like total system failure. And like I couldn't fall asleep because essentially what would happen is I would be drifting off to sleep and I'd be fucking dead tired, obviously, because I'm having terrible sleep anyway. Um... I'm getting ahead of myself. The doctors, they, they didn't find any bronchitis. They didn't find any fucking COVID. They didn't find any of this goddamn shit. And I, because my brain was fucked, I neglected to mention the protein bar until a lot later because I didn't think it was the protein bar. I thought it was some other bullshit. I thought it was something else that was not as stupid as, oh, the protein bar you ate was bad and potentially there was an allergic reaction. I was thinking it was something else. I thought it was related to the cough and yada, yada, yada. So I had like a red herring. I was like, it was like a fucking detective novel and I was falling for the easy bait. And I couldn't tell the doctor the correct information that likely would have given me antibiotics or something. Anyway, <clears throat> I had glass bones, paper skin, shit was fucked. I wish I was on camera for this because I am emoting like a motherfucker like I always do on stream. Uh, and it is all wasted on my webcam, which is unplugged and turned around, which is the way I keep it. So that's a shame. But at least, you know, you have me talking here, kind of. Um, so yeah, when it came to falling asleep, I would lay down, I'd be dead tired, I'd be drifting off to sleep, and then it would feel like I would stop breathing. Like, that was my thought process. Like, oh, I'm falling asleep, I feel like I miss a breath, and it's like, oh shit, am I gonna stop breathing for good? And then I wake back up, and the cycle repeats itself. Of that over and over and over and over and over again. Where I'm getting, like, a minute or two of sleep at a time. Uh, now, obviously, I'm able to fall asleep eventually, for, like, a half hour, and obviously, like, I awake, and my breathing has not stopped permanently, because I'm alive, so it wasn't actually a thing that was going to happen, but my brain thought, oh, shit, it might be, Lamau, so uh, we should be careful about that and stay conscious, because at least at that point, we can force breath, you know? So that was, like, six days of my life was just that. It was real bad. Uh, eventually, I got through it, and I have to say, big shouts out to Adam from Your Movie Sucks, the YMS Highlights channel, and his long-form videos on his main channel carried me. Like, on the wings of an angel. Like, Adam from YMS is, like, descending from the heavens, like, mercy in that one meme. That, it distracted me. Like, I remember being, like, schlumped on the living room couch with YMS's Kimba the Lion video on the TV, and I was sitting with my roommate Vermin, and they were keeping me company to try to help me keep sane. And um, like I passed out a little bit, woke back up, passed out a little bit, woke back up. 
Eventually, I went to my bed to try to sleep properly, you know, and, and repeated the process of passed out a little bit, woke back up. And I just have like a spotty memory of a variety of different Kimba the Lion and the Lion King live action YMS videos just in my mind etched. And like I would put it on repeat too. Uh, like I would make sure it looped just in case I did get a lot of sleep. And then that was just part of my life was just like making a playlist of YMS highlight videos and just looping through those and seeing them uh, just to like keep my mind occupied by something while I suffered there. And god damn, that shit sucked. It was a whole ordeal. I would not want it to happen again, but I am kind of glad that it did in one way, in that it prepared me for this recovery as well as any future recoveries I might have from something like that, because that may be the worst I've ever had. Because like at that point, you have to remember, I'm having difficulty eating and keeping in calories. So like I'm chugging and sure like a motherfucker. I'm taking Pepto-Bismol, you know, I'm taking cough drops because I'm still coughing from that lingering cough. At, at some point, I realized like, oh, this seems to be gastrointestinal. I think one of the reasons why I'm having difficulty breathing is because I'm having like indigestion, but not with acid, but rather with like maybe gas and like pressure in my stomach, which was pushing up on like my lungs and whatnot or something like that. It was fucking it up somehow. And so then I'd started being more mindful of like taking Pepto-Bismol and that helped a little bit. So it seems like the bad protein bar was the culprit, uh, potentially also an allergic reaction. Who's to say? Uh, maybe I ate like half of a mouse that got into the protein bar and I just didn't realize it. And it was like gangrenous and decrepit. Who's to say? You know, it's impossible to know. It didn't kill me, but it, and it somehow made me stronger. So, <laughs> But yeah, so like the recovery for this was a lot easier as it would turn out. Uh, so to snap back to reality, which I could not figure out what it was for a little bit. <clears throat> so I had had the epithelium, like I say, removed from the eye, the UV drops put in for 30 minutes, and then the UV drops plus UV light combination put in for another 30 minutes. Everything is chilled during the process. I'm vibing. It's not comfortable, obviously, because I'm having to stay still. And my neck was in pain because I had neck pain from sleeping weirdly the previous night and having to keep my head still. You know, it wasn't like a luxury first class airline bed that I was laying on either. So like my neck was fucked up and it still hurt after that. I ended up getting a migraine from that, my, like the neck pain as well. I imagine as the pain from the eye and the UV light and keeping my eye open for fucking 30 minutes, staring at lasers. So like I was nauseous because of the migraine. When it comes to the actual eye itself, wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, it was mostly the, the initial migraine and nausea caused from it that really made the recovery difficult. But yeah, so like I'm in the pharmacy line waiting to get my goddamn prescription eye drops because they accidentally sent it to the wrong pharmacy of a similar name. So then I ended up having to get them transferred over to another one, but we got it. I ended up getting cookies as well. I still have some of those. I'm probably going to eat them tonight from the grocery store that the pharmacy was in. While I'm waiting in line with sunglasses on in my old ass crusty hoodie with crusty ass vitamin B drops streamed down my eye. I looked sus as hell, but it is what it is. I'm squinting my left eye, and then eventually, the best way I can describe it is, you know when you're really fucking tired, and you're trying to keep your eyes open, but, like, your body's like, nah, dude, we're not staying awake. Like, your eyes are shutting, and you're losing consciousness, and you're gonna thank me for it later, and if you're behind the wheel of a car, it is what it is. I, we didn't put you in that position, okay? Maybe you should have made better decisions before, you know, operating heavy machinery. Luckily, I wasn't. I was standing in a fucking pharmacy line waiting. <laughs> but um, it felt like when you're trying to keep your eyes open when you're really fucking tired and your body is forcing them shut. Except I wasn't tired because I had gotten like six hours of sleep, which is not ideal for me because like I need a good amount of sleep to function as a human being because I'm fatigued by default for a lot of reasons, which I've talked about in the past. I have chronic fatigue issues. I've got a lot of shit. I'm fucked up, okay? I got disabilities. It is what it is. So I'm standing in the line, and, and, like, my eyes are closing. Like, I can't keep them open. But I need to be able to see what's going on around me. I need to see who is in line in front of me. I got to see and make sure nobody's pickpocketing me, which is not likely to happen. But it could, you know? Who's, who's to say? I'm trying to be present in the moment. I'm trying to live within reality, right? Um, but my, my eyes are not having any of it. 
My eyes are like that when I look at the sky on a bright day. Yeah, similarly to that too, which is also probably part of it, condensed can meat, where it's like when you're looking at something really bright and your eyes are forcing themselves shut because they don't want to get damaged. That shit sucks. And, you know, respect. I get it. It was like that as well. Um, but it, it feels a lot like when I'm very tired and trying to keep my eyes awake and they're just forcing them to close. It's also possible that the literal eyeball was tired too from staying open for 30 minutes. And then the numbing eye drops wear off and then all this shit starts happening and all the stimuli is happening in the fucking pharmacy and yada, yada, yada. It was not great. So I essentially looked like Booba Peak or Conyer Peak where like my eyes would be closed and I'd be forcing one open every now and again, the right one, the one that wasn't operated on, uh, to be able to fucking see anything. <laughs> So then it's absolute hell going outside into the sun because this procedure happened at nine in the goddamn morning. So by the time it was done and we were getting home, it was like 11 and 12 because of like travel time and shit. Going out into the sun was absolute hell. I essentially had to just have my eyes closed the whole time and just follow the phantom of my friend who was walking with me, who was very kind through the whole thing. And I cannot thank them enough. He's a good guy. But, um, so I, you know, I get home eventually and I'm fucked in the head by this point. Like, reality has ceased to exist. I'm in the ethereal plane. I look like shit. I feel like shit. You know, I get all the shit I need to do. I put the eye drops in my eyes because I wasn't going to do that shit in the car after getting them from the pharmacy. Uh, and I lay down. Uh, I get, like, ice cubes, which you're allowed to do. Well, ideally, you have, like, an ice pack or like frozen peas even. All I had were ice cubes, so I got ice cubes, put them in a Ziploc baggie, got a damn paper towel, put it on my eye, then put the ice cubes on top of my eye because the swelling around the eye sucks a lot. And that helped a lot. And then when I'm laying down there, I'm listening to the God amongst men, once again, coming down like mercy in that one gift, Northern Lion, Mr. Ryan Letourneau, if that is his real name. So it was Adam from YMS, your movie sucks, for the previous one. And then this time, I've been on Northern Lion content for a long time, uh, and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go to the Library of Letourneau, which is a fan channel that puts together a bunch of compilation videos, and, you know, my ass is watching Best of Northern Lion January 2024, nine-hour-long video. And I'm just, every hour, I'm drifting in and out of consciousness in this entire process. Because, like, I figure, like, I don't need to sleep, but my eyes are closed anyway, and I'm kind of tired. So I might as well. It'll, you know, sleeping already is a time skip. You know, it's fast travel. So might as well sleep through the recovery process. But the thing about that was, is that for one, the discomfort in the eye would keep me awake or wake me up. So in terms of what the eye felt like afterward, they did send me away with um, the same numbing drops that they used on the eye for the procedure. And it says on the sheet... Use one drop every two hours as needed for breakthrough pain control. Only use the drop for the first 24 hours after the procedure, then stop. If you do not need this drop, it is better to not use it. That's what it says. I used it once or twice to, like, renumb the eye, essentially, to not have to deal with this bullshit. But in terms of the pain, it actually wasn't that bad, <laughs> funnily enough. Like, there's a scratchiness to it at this point. Like, like I say, I have, like, a rigid contact lens in my eye. Like, I'm light-sensitive. The eyes don't want to stay open. Both eyes even. The right one, which wasn't operated on, uh, is also being affected by it because, you know, it's a pair. It comes in twos. My left nostril is leaking like a motherfucker because my entire sinus system is being fucked with by my eye being messed with. It was a whole can of worms. But yeah, so, like, I have to put in these artificial tears that are preservative-free. They made it clear that that's the best option. You don't want standard eye drops. You want preservative-free ones. And they come in these, like, single-use vials that you twist the top off of. And I have to do that every hour to keep it lubricated. It's not a necessity, but it helps the healing process, and it helps your comfort. So I did. So, like, until I meant to go to sleep for the night, which at this point I was not, because it was, like, 12 p.m. I'm in my dark-ass room vampire maxing, waking up every 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Hour maximum of sleep. And then my timer would go off for the artificial tier, the eyeball alarm would go off, which I still have running now. And then every four hours, I have to put in the steroid eye drop and the antibiotic eye drop as well. Those being ofloxacin and prednisolone. Now, I don't know why pred is alone, but apparently he's alone and it's a shame. But those are the two that I have to do every four hours while I'm awake. And then when I sleep, luckily, you know, I just sleep. I don't have to wake up every hour. Now, I did because I wasn't sleeping fully anyway, 
So I figured, you know, if I wake up while I'm asleep, I'm not going to have alarms going off every hour if I'm sleeping for the night. But if I do wake up, I will use the artificial eye drops anyway, because like, why not? And then I'll put a note of what time it was so that if I wake up in another hour, like might as well. You're on steroids? Yeah, my eyeball has a six pack abs now, you know? It looks like this. There's my eye. And it's just like, it's got pecs. It's got fucking six pack abs. The striations are insane. It's got the V. You know, it's wearing gray sweats. It's brolic as fuck. <laughs> but yeah, um, so that's that. The discomfort is like a scratchiness. It's like a general soreness. Like your eyes are blurry. With the contact lens in, it always feels like there's something in your eye. Uh, and even if the contact lens wasn't in it, because there is literally something in your eye, the scratchiness and discomfort and whatnot make it always feel like there's something in your eye, but you're not allowed to rub your eyes for obvious reasons. Because one, they're sensitive and they're trying to heal. Or it's sensitive, rather, and it's trying to heal. For two, if you rub your eyes, the contact lens cast or bandage lens can fall out and you're not supposed to put it back in for obvious reasons because of, like, bacteria and whatnot. Um, so, like, you just, you're not allowed to touch your eyes, essentially, except for, like, dabbing on it because it's in pain and the rest of your body isn't. Dabbing it, like, when you put eye drops in and whatnot. Luckily, I already got in the habit of not rubbing my eyes because once I found out that I had keratoconus, one of the things was, well, if the lining is weaker, if you put a lot of pressure on your eye, you can fuck that shit up. You can make it worse. So I was like, okay, I will not sleep on my eyeball. And because of this, I sleep on literally the edge of my pillow. So like, you know how you'll have a pillow, right? And then when you put your little head on it, it dips in a little bit. Well, I'm a side sleeper. So if that happens, like my eyeball is like right here. It's getting blasted by a pillow. Though if you're side sleeping, you usually want firmer pillow anyway. So what I do is I have like the literal edge of the pillow and I put my face right here so that my eyeball is not on the pillow at all, which is not ideal, but it works, <laughs> you know, and that just makes sure my eyeball doesn't get any pressure on it. I don't think that's a genuine, like 100% really big concern, uh, but it's just like a thing I'm doing because just in case, you know, who's to say, like the doctor didn't say to do this. And I was, I, I asked them, like, yo, so I'm a side sleeper. Now that there's this contact lens cast in my eye, should I, like, make an effort to not sleep on my side? And they were like, nah, it's chill. Just don't rub your eyes, dickhead. And I was like, okay. <clears throat> you don't have to say it like that, but all right. Damn. Editor's note, they didn't actually say that. But they did say it wasn't a problem. That said, I still tried to avoid it a little bit. <clears throat> so essentially, I'd be sleeping like this. So, like, here's my face. Round. And then... I guess my face is actually more like this because I have a Chad jaw and then my eye is fucked. So I have essentially over both eyes because the other eye is like sore for having to take up the slack of the left eye that's been fucked with. So I have like a damp paper towel on my eye and then I have a bunch. Then I have ice cubes in a goddamn Ziploc. This is not the ice you usually find in a Ziploc, but I'm, I have no weight to move right now. So I'm chilling. I have this rested on my goddamn face, but the Ziploc is too big, so I, like, I have to fold this down two ways to get it to not like slump over onto like my forehead and annoy me, or like on my nose and annoy me. <laughs> yeah, so that's on it as well. And that felt good as hell. I did that for like the first two nights, and then a little bit on the third. But that wasn't actually that bad, luckily. The sleep was not that bad. And I had an excuse to have Northern Lion videos on all night while sleeping. And I love having an excuse to do that because when I sleep normally, my phone is across the room away from me with the alarm on so that when I wake up, it forces me to get up and then I turn it off and then I go sit down in my goddamn computer chair. I sit my white ass down and listen so that I don't go back into bed because if I go back into bed, I'll fall back asleep and then I'll oversleep and then I'll get out of bed at like 7 p.m. and that's not great. <clears throat> so I fixed that problem by doing that. I did have a problem where I would get up, walk over to it, turn it off and then go back to bed and lay back down. But at that point, that's a discipline problem, and, like, you gotta figure that shit out. And I fixed it, luckily, but I did have that problem for a while. <laughs> luckily, becoming less depressed by getting on an antidepressant and having my ADHD fuck with me less by getting on an ADHD med helped with my excitedness to get out of bed. Because um, a big part of it was like, well, what the fuck's the point of getting out of bed? Like, what the hell's the point? Like, I'm depressed. I got ADHD, which makes doing shit hard anyway, so I might as well just go back to bed and lay there. Also, it's cold and it's cozy under the blankets, and blah, blah, blah. And I like dreaming, which is like unironically a real thing. I enjoy dreaming a lot. Uh, I've lucid dreamed before, yada, yada, yada. But now I have like reasons to be excited 
where I had those reasons to be excited in the past. It's just that my brain was like, hey, fuck you, man. We're going to debuff you and your body in like 17,000 different ways because we hate you or something. I don't know. I've got a whole bunch of debuffs, though, and uh, ADHD depression was one of them. So luckily, it's helped me a little bit. And now the things that I am excited to get up for that I could have been before, it's like unlocked. You know, it's like in Dark Souls when you've had to like fight through 8,000 enemies to get to one point. And then you get to that point and you turn around and like, oh, here's an elevator that descends downward and then unlocks a door that's locked from the other side, you know, it's called a thousand times. And then you can actually just do the quick shortcut. It's like that to have, you know, ADHD depression meds for me, which is nice. Like the path was always there. It was just blocked. But yeah, anyway. So yeah. And now it's been five days later. I went and got the contact lens cast off. They checked me out. Shit's going good. They said, believe me, folks, it's one of the best recoveries we've ever seen. Nobody has ever recovered better. That's what they said to me. <clears throat> Donald Trump was there personally to deliver that information to me. I got Subway on the way home, ate it. I don't know what people say about Subway being bad. I guess it depends on the Subway you're going to and where they get their shit from and who's working there. But every time I've had Subway in my life, it's been a banger. I haven't had it in literal years, so I figured I would get it because I saw it. I got Italian herbs and cheese bread. I put ham on that. Uh, I got lettuce, tomato, pepper jack cheese, red onion, mayonnaise. I didn't get it toasted because I wasn't eating it there and it was a bit of time to get back home. So I had it cold, which is still fine. Ate that shit while sipping on a Coca-Cola, rewatching season two of Mob Psycho. It was good. And then, uh, you know, I made my little PNG tube avatar that you're seeing right now and uh, started a stream. And I've still had to do the two eye drops, the antibiotic and the steroid every four hours. At this point, after the contact lens is out, I technically do not have to do the artificial tears every hour. I think I'm still gonna for the first week, and then after that, I'm gonna see what's good uh, with that. Because then after that, it's every four hours, at least it says, for the artificial tears for until your one month checkup. Anyway, is there anything else to be said here? Kind of just riffing, which is fun. So yeah, Keratoconier. Shit sucks, man. So it's, it's fairly rare, so I've been unlucky with the amount of debuffs I've gotten. My stat rolls were not great. It wasn't a point buy system. They weren't karmic dice. I got hella debuffs. I'm probably multi-classing because of ADHD with no actual good cohesion. It's a mess. And uh, Keratoconus is just one of them. Let's see how rare it is. I looked this up. I think it's like one in 2,000 people. How rare is Keratoconus USA? <clears throat> Keratoconus incurs in approximately 1 in 2,000 individuals, typically beginning in puberty and progressing into the mid-30s. Early stages can be treated with glasses, but the progression of the disease into the late childhood and early adulthood, corneal transplantation may be needed to restore sight. Luckily, cross-linking can halt a lot of this. Oh, also, I should say, so I first realized I had keratoconus some years ago. The main reason why it's taken this long to actually get the procedure is mostly my fault. ADHD depression is a son of a bitch when it comes to making appointments. <laughs> as it would turn out, and caring about your well-being, uh, much to the empty, unfortunate, voiceless masses that are the people I live with being like, you should probably make that appointment. Like, you should figure that shit out. That's important. And I'm like, yeah, I know that, but uh, have you considered that I will frequently be stunlocked on some random bullshit for hours until a cat or somebody else walks past my door by happenstance and then I'm broken out of a trance that whatever wizard it is that's casted a spell on me is placed on me and then I can finally be a human being again? Clearly not, because that's what's always happening. But yeah, so the, the first, there was like, I went to like a lens crafters or some shit to maybe get glasses, get my eyes checked out. Because my left eye was getting worse, but my right eye wasn't. And I've heard that, like, if you have, like, astigmatism or whatever, I know it can affect both eyes differently. Like, a regular bad eye vision stuff. So, like, I went there and I was like, yo, I've tried to get glasses in the past and, like, it's not worked. Like, they can never find a good lens for my eye. And the dude was like, yeah, stupid ass motherfuckers, because you have keratoconus, idiot. We looked at the internal pressure of your eye and the map of your eye and your cornea is all screwed up. That's why the glasses don't work, because it's not a problem that a simple standard lens could fix. It's actually a deeper, more complex problem where you would need a complex lens if you're going to have one at all, or something like that. And he was like, here is a specialist that I will refer you to, and you'll get checked out there properly for the keratoconus. So yeah, that's how I found out. Before that, I had gone to a Walmart to try to get glasses. Because I was trying to draw on paper, and I draw really small and really fine lines a lot of the time. And I was realizing that under certain lighting conditions, the lighting conditions that I was always in in that room, this was back when I was in New Jersey, I was just not able to see what the fuck I was doing in my left eye. 
And I was like, oh, that's not great. I don't like that. <laughs> so I went to, uh, you know, the lens place in a Walmart, and they fit me for glasses. The shit barely worked. But I guess they just didn't realize it or whatever. But, uh, and the glass, the frames I chose were terrible. Anyway, I never ended up really wearing them. And then before that, I was working in a drive through for a while. For, like, almost a decade, essentially. Maybe, well, actually less than that, because the other part of that was um, working in the kitchen of a supermarket. But anyway, for more than five years, I was in a drive through And often when I was on the window, for some ungodly reason, and I know the reason, it's because it's easier to clean and it doesn't rust, there's stainless steel where the window is, so that when the sun was in the perfect spot in the sky... It would reflect off of the stainless steel of the surface where, like, you could put food and then hand it out and yada, yada, yada to reflect directly into my fucking eyeball. Um, and it sucked. <clears throat> so, like, I had to position myself in a weird way to avoid that. And, like, I kept telling them, like, yo, I'm, people are getting blinded by this shit, bro. Like, it is the sun, which is a deadly laser. We know we learn from the history of everything video from Bill Wirtz. Maybe we do something about this. Obviously, nothing ever happens. This is fucking corpo. And uh, so I thought for a while that, well, it was always the left side of my face that was on that side getting blasted by the sun. Oh, yeah, because like, so that side of my face was always being blasted by the sun, my left eye, and that's the eye that's worse. So I thought, oh, well, if only my left eye's sight is getting worse, maybe it's because of the fact that the sun is constantly hitting me in the eye, despite my best effort. I felt like that for my layman's understanding of how the eye works, that was a fine hypothesis to make. And it po it's possible that it could have had a part to play in some capacity with the waning of my vision. But no, it turns out that the primary thing is that I have an exceedingly rare eye disease that, if left untreated, could make me go blind. So that's cool. Luckily, it's been treated, so we'll see. You know, I'll have to get regular checkups throughout my life at varying intervals to make sure that it's not progressing past the point that it's currently trying to be held at, like Spider-Man with the fucking two train cars. And yeah, my right eye also has it. Not as worse, but it, it also is affected by it. It is often the case that it's both, but sometimes it's just one for people. Um, so I will need to get my right eye done at some point. I think it's usually three months after your first eye. So I'll have to go through it all again, so that'll be great. But after that, it'll just be my third eye that's left. But I don't think I have keratoconus in my third eye. I think that would mean I would have aphantasia, which luckily I don't. So, yeah, so that's that. Uh, so now I'm going to put artificial tears in my eye because I'm never crying real tears because I'm a man and men don't cry. That's why I got to put artificial ones in there to make sure society thinks I'm actually a human being and not an automaton. Anyway, <clears throat> that's a pretty scary thought to have in the back of your mind that you could go blind eventually because of a disease that's completely out of your control. Yeah, that sucks. And it was a big part of like my <clears throat> depression, anxiety shit, I'm sure, for a while. Um, so now that half of it is done, that's pretty good. Don't Gregory me. <laughs> this is a rare emote. So good, though, for mom jokes. But yeah, so that's that. Um, moral of the story, it is helpful to get checked out if you think something is wrong with you potentially even second opinions. Because in my view, it was sheer luck that this was found to begin with by that lens crafter, eye doctor person. Because I had gone to a previous eye place and they did not catch it, even though it was likely to be affecting me at that time. Because I did notice that my left eye's vision was getting worse. And that was in like my early to becoming mid-20s, which is around when it tends to start. You, you know, puberty and then a little bit later, in mid-adulthood. <clears throat> or mid-young adulthood? I don't fucking know. And, you know, healthcare being in the state that it is in the U.S., it's difficult, but hopefully you're able to make it happen somehow. That wouldn't be great, Alex, but if it happened to somebody in your high school, I feel like that's too rapid from what I understand about keratoconus, but I don't know. But yeah, so there's that. Also, um, I was trying to phonetically spell through katakana a variety of words, and here's some of them. I also made a skibbity duckling. Because I, I drew Skibbity Toilet, but it, then it looked like a duckling because of the mouth I put on it. So now it's a duck. And he's going, quack, or quack, quack, quack. Uh, and you could also write it as Skibbity Duckling. See? Su, ki, b, d, Skibbity Da. You have to extend the A because that's what the line is. Da, ku, di, n, ku. 
Chocolatey. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Take care.